Welcome, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. You have to forgive me if my voice sounds weird. I got my ear, my right ear is all jacked up for some reason. Say it sounds like reverb in my right ear. Anyways. Yes. I have a mic on. Yes. I promise you. Testing. So, I do not like this lectern. It's too small. Okay? Just want that to be known. Pardon me, that'd be fine. Yeah, thank you. All right. My little talk today is titled, How Shall We Come Into Unity? I prayed when I was given this service that what I should talk about and what should I bring to the people. The Lord has given me that this is what we need here in this church today is unity. Unity. How shall we, and we'll say it another way, how shall we be in Christ? How shall we all believe? Are we concerned with opinions? I hope not. Fancy little word liturgy. How do we do church? How do we do church? What is a church? Is it just a building? What's the most important part of a church? How are they united? In Christ. In Christ. By the word of God, right? Not, not opinion, correct? All of us have opinions. Did Jesus have his own opinion? Glad to hear the notes. Did he even speak his own words? No. Well, we got a good bunch here. They know the Bible. How did Jesus live? He even said himself, by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, correct? What is your way of the way? What is in your way, I should say, of the way? You know, I hate winter. I hate winter. I despise winter. I do not like cold in any stretch of the imagination. So I don't look at winter. Although it's right here in front of me, I look beyond it to see summer. Because that's what I hope for. That's what I look for. I'm wondering today, what is it that's in your way? It's stopping us from having unity. What is in your way today that is stopping you from seeing Christ? Is there something blocking your vision? You need to move because certainly God hasn't moved. God is in the same place he's always been. So do you need to, to look in a different way? Unity, as it is defined, is a thing undivided itself, undivided itself, but separate from every other thing. Hmm. Sounds like a marriage, doesn't it? Unity. Would it be safe to say that this church and you people all together would seek unity? Would that be safe to say? Amen. Amen. 
Got a few in there. Psalm 133. Brother just read that. 133 and verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in division. Unity. Unity. What is unity again? It is a thing undivided itself, but separate from everything else, or every other thing. What do we do that causes disunity? Any ideas? Independent thought. Pardon me? Independent thought. Judge. Judge. Criticize, bicker, gossip. Gossip. Put self first. Woo! Put self first. <laughs> How does the Word of God address these things? Let's turn to John. I love the Book of John. Probably my favorite. It is definitely my favorite gospel. We've got probably another now. Let's turn to chapter 75. This, this year, if you have a, a heading in your Bible, it will say something like Jesus' intercessory prayer. This is a prayer of Jesus. It, is it all written in red in most of your Bibles, I would say? All right, let's, let's just begin to read down some of the Word of God here, beginning in 17.1. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. What is, what is Jesus' purpose? Do you hear it there? He wants to glorify the Father. His thought is always of the Father, right? Verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So what, what is Jesus saying there? Where is life come from? From God, right? Jesus is the way to God. Correct? John 14, 6. And in verse 4 it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Amen. Amen. Mm. Is that past tense? Yes. <clears throat> what work did Jesus do? Gave them his words. 
Father. And they, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. Where is Jesus looking? Do you see where Jesus is looking? Is there any obstacle that was ever in Jesus' path? There was many things that people tried to put in Jesus' path as obstacles to break the unity, to break his connection with, with God the Father. But did he allow anything to come between him and his Father? And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Is that a powerful prayer? Wow. Do we believe that prayer? While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those thou hast given me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because thou art not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. By beholding, we become changed. Isn't that what the Bible says? And how do we become changed in the likeness of Jesus Christ? By what? By beholding him, his word. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Whew. Did you hear that? Jesus is praying directly for you and I today. In that prayer. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That thou also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Amen? Amen. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them. Do you believe that? Do you possess this glory? That they may be what? One. Even as we are one. I am them and thou in me. That they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and that hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, righteous Father. Ooh. Isn't God holy? Amen. And that says, O righteous Father. Brothers and sisters, that is big. The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name. And will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Whew. That's quite a prayer, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's a powerful prayer. So what does the world see, brothers and sisters, when it looks 
at you and I. Love. Love. Let's turn our Bibles to Amos. You know what that little book of Amos is? The major prophets, the, the minor, minor little prophets with major things to say. <laughs> Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Amos 3. 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Isn't that what it says? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Is unity uniformity? No. no. All right. If you have a hard time finding Amos, just stick something in there because we're going to come back there later. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians and chapter 6. 6 and 14. Y'all get there, just say amen. 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 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Biel? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith, saith the Lord God Almighty. Having therefore these, these what? Promises. Promises. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God has made a distinction here, hasn't he? Hasn't God made a distinction through his Bible that light in darkness, male and female, clean and unclean, has God done that? Has He made distinctions? Okay. So do you do you see by the, you can't you can't have let, let me see. is a partial agreement an agreement? No. It's not, is it? How many times has there been wars and they've had a little agreement and everybody thinks everything's fine, but it's not a, it's not a full agreement, it's a little partial agreement. What happens? It breaks out again, doesn't it? It continues to break out until you come to a full agreement. If we, reckon, if we recognize these divisions, then and only then can we become united because we are in agreement with God. Do you understand that? Does that make any sense? Satan seeks to conquer by uniting without divisions, you see. God has always had a people to carry the message of the present truth. He has never failed to have a people. To have unity, brothers and sisters, means that there needs to be a setting apart, a coming away are coming into the truth. You follow me? God only raised two churches, and the latter came out of a great disappointment, a sifting, if you will, okay? A, a, a very heavy sifting, because there was people that were willing to follow God in the most holy place, but there was this other group of people that did not want to go. Correct? That's what this church came out of. What did they do? They dug in, didn't they? And what did they do? They sought the Lord. Where he was, what he was doing, what was important to him. They wanted to have unity with God. Amen. And they didn't care what it cost them in the world. 
And if it meant that they had to separate from some people. God calls all people. All people. He died for all men. I'm not cutting anybody down here, brothers and sisters. I'm trying to allow us to see truth where the devil seeks to just, it's all good, brother. Bring it all in. We'll work it out in heaven, right? But well, wait a minute. There has to be a putting away of sin. Correct? Because God cannot come until there, he has a people ready to receive him. A small group came together. That's what happened. Birthed this, this church. What is our relationship with Jesus today? What is it today? Do we, do we look like the world? Or do we look like God's people? How well do we know Him? How well do we know Him? What does He say? Follow me. Right? Follow me. In belief, brothers and sisters, we must be united. Because that's where, the, that's where the devil can separate and divide. We have to be of one mind and belief. And where does that belief come from? The word. From the word of God. It's one thing to have opinions. We all have opinions. And they can be separate and different. But we have to be together as one in belief if we're going to be unified. And the only way that Christ is going to come back and we can end life as we know it on this planet is if we're unified. Because when we are unified, brothers and sisters, in the Word of God, we will not look like the world anymore. And the world will not be able to stand it. Do you understand that? They couldn't stand the disciples. Do you realize that they turned the world upside down? This has to happen again for Christ to return. I want to read you something <clears throat> from uh, Testimonies to Ministers. Individual responsibility and Christian unity. God is leading a people out from the world upon the exalted platform of external of eternal truth. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, he will discipline and fit up his people. They will not be at variance. One believing one thing and another having faith and views entirely opposite, each moving independently of the body. Through the diversity of gifts and governments that he has placed in the church, they will all come to the unity of the faith. You hear that? The unity of the faith. Isn't that remarkable? The unity of the faith. I love those little words. This doesn't just say unity of faith. Do you hear that? Do you hear the definite article in there? Unity of the faith. Don't read over these little words in your Bible. They're so important. If one man takes his view of Bible truth without regard to the opinion of his brethren and justifies his course, alleging that he has a right to his own peculiar views and then presses them upon another, how can he be fulfilling the prayer of Christ? Amen? Amen. And if another, and still another, arises, each asserting his right to believe and talk what he pleases without reference to the faith of of the body where will be that harmony which existed between Christ and his Father in which Christ prayed might exist among his brethren. Though we have an individual work and an individual responsibility before God, we are not to follow our own independent judgment. Regardless of the opinions and feelings of our brethren, for this course would lead to disorder in the church. It is the duty of ministers to respect the judgment of their brethren, but their relations to one 
but their relations to one another, as well as the doctrines they teach, should be brought to the, to the test of the law and the testimony. Then if hearts are teachable, there will be no division among us. Do you hear that? No division among us. What do we want? Is this what we want? Because this is what's going to bring Jesus back, brothers and sisters. I, I'm excited about this kind of stuff. There will be no division among us. Some are inclined to be disorderly and are drifting away from the great landmarks of the faith. But God is moving upon his ministers to be one in doctrine and in spirit. It is necessary that our unity today be a character that will bear the test of trial. We may have lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. That's huge. God and heaven, God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. As long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistency, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. Man. Testimonies of ministers, 29 and 30. 1 Corinthians, 12 and 13. You get there, say amen. amen. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. You hear the oneness there? One. Psalm 86. Psalm 86. I like to let the word speak for itself. I don't sit, have to sit here and tell you people what the word says. All I need to do is read the word, correct? You don't care about my opinion. You didn't come here to hear my opinion. You came here to get the word of God. Amen. Psalm 86 and 5. What does that say? For thou, Lord, art God, art, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that what? you call upon the Lord? Do you seek His mercy? Let's go to verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Amen. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians in chapter 4. You get there to say amen? amen. Chapter 4, it says what? Unity. This is my heading above chapter 4. It says unity through the gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in this the Bible says love. Okay? And that's G26 there because it's agape. So that means it means you could say God. Alright? I want to say, I want to clarify something. Something was said that God has the attribute of love. Alright? I, I want to animately right here today disagree with that. God does not have the attribute of love. The Bible says that God is love, okay, period. So if we could somehow dissect God into however many pieces you wanted to cut God up into and put him in all these different places, every single part of that would be love, okay? An attribute is a part of something. Like, 
like the testament that was put on the outside of the ark, the 603 rules that Moses gave that was written on parchment paper. But the law, the Ten Commandments written in stone, was put inside the ark. You follow me? God is love. He never stopped being love. He is everything he is because he is love. Does, does that, amen? amen? All right, so we can say then, with all holiness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in 